Hi, my name is Zach London. I'm a clinical professor of neurology uh, here at the University of Michigan. I'm also the residency director. And I'm here today to talk to you about the Legion, Charcot's Tournament, a tabletop strategy board game that I developed with my colleague Jim Burke and graphic designer Nina Schwartz to help teach some of the fundamental concepts of neuroanatomic localization. So the idea here is that we have our brains hooked up to our bodies, um, and our bodies hooked up to our brains, and there are signals that go back and forth between the brain and the body that send messages. And understanding how those messages get from one place to another helps us take care of our patients because by examining them, we can figure out what abnormalities they have on exam and use the knowledge of those pathways to localize lesions in the nervous system. So this is a really a fundamental concept that is being taught all over the world in neuroscience and neuroanatomy courses and in medical schools uh, that's useful to clinical neurologists. The body hasn't changed for millions of years and probably won't for millions more, so this is really what I would call a foundational topic. But it's something that is sort of terrifying to a lot of students. Jim Burke and I decided that we wanted to try to teach this in a new way that would be sort of fun and engaging, and uh, we decided to do it as a board game. Now, why board games? So I think board games are more popular now than ever, and there are a lot of great reasons for that. Uh, first and foremost, it is something that brings people together. You know, I think in this, in this age of technology, we worry a lot about the technology pulling people apart. We're interacting only through our devices. Board games get people together. They bring together families and friends and colleagues, and you, you sit around a table, and you look at each other, and you interact with each other, um, and you can also be eating or drinking or talking about other things while you're doing it. Um, and it sort of scratches that social edge. And I think sort of another thing that board games do that is sort of unique as a way to engage people is it sort of brings out the competitive spirit. A lot of our learners that we're aiming at are medical students and residents, people who we're trying to get them to be excited about neuroscience rather than scared of it. And medical students, if you haven't figured this out, a lot of them are sort of innately competitive people, uh, but it's not socially acceptable to be so, or at least to appear so, during medical school. I think the other reason why we really wanted to do a board game has to do with, I guess I would say, the shelf life of the product. But anyone who's ever worked on app development or website development knows that those things have an expiration date. You know, if you, if you develop an app and you put all your heart and soul into it and a lot of money into it, you put it out in the world, a year or two later, it may be obsolete uh, because the technology changes, the platform changes, um, web security changes, or somebody with more resources has gone and done the same thing but better. And I think we really like the idea of a board game because you can take a game that has beautiful artwork and play it and then put it on your shelf, take it out a year later or five years later or ten years later, it'll be the exact same thing and it'll still be every bit as useful and every bit as engaging. And that was, I think, the other reason we really wanted it to be about what I would call a foundational topic, a topic that isn't going to change, like anatomy, because again, hopefully, 10 years from now, human anatomy will be the same that it is now. So how did we get started? Uh, we had this idea, and we got funding from a private philanthropic donor. So this is from the Jerry Eisler Neuromuscular Fund that paid for this. And we started just by doing mock-ups on paper. And we knew that we wanted the game board to sort of look like the human nervous system, to have a brain and a brain stem and different segments of the spinal cord, and that people would be putting down uh, tokens, or lesions as we were calling them, on this board and collecting points. So that was sort of the fundamental thing that we knew going into this. And then we drew up our game board, and we basically sat around a table, and, uh, and we just came up with 10 or 20 different sets of rules, and we just kept playing them and tweaking them. And um, it was really a, an iterative process. So we would try something out, and if it didn't quite work, we would change it, or we would try it out on medical students or residents who were working with us. So we got lots of different people engaged in the process um, until we found a set of rules that we felt was fun and taught the material well and took about an hour to play, which is, I think, what we wanted the, the, the game time to be. And part of the fun for me, I mean, I would have to say, by the way, the development of the game was as fun as playing it. Like, this whole process was a delight from the beginning. 
So this is the Legion Charcot's tournament, and um, you can see on the cover what it's supposed to look like is an old operating theater. There's a patient there, and the four main characters are around this patient performing a neurologic examination uh, using the tools that they had at their time, like an old reflex hammer and a tuning fork. There are four board game boards, rather, um, and so each player gets their own game board. And this is an example of one of them. This is William Gowers from, uh, from England. And you can tell because Queen Victoria is uh, on the wall. And he has a bandolier made of little tuning forks, which are one of the neurology tools. So again, all of this is very silly. And in the middle, you have your brain, your brain stem, and your spinal cord. And in this game, um, people will be finding ways to put little lesions on those places. These lesions are these little uh, glass beads and then keep score around the outside and, uh, and a certain number of criteria will be met when the game ends, whoever has the most points will win. And a lot of the game is based on cards and here's a deck of cards and each card has two sides and on one side it'll show a picture of um, of the, what we call the neuroaxis, the brain and spinal cord, with a pathway going down it, sort of like a blue line showing how those two parts connect. And it'll say on the bottom what you could have. So in this case, it says weakness of the right lower face. And if you flip the card over, it'll show a person that has weakness of their right lower face. Everybody, of course, is dressed up in Victorian garb. And what ends up happening is um, the people who understand the neuroanatomy, who have these pathways memorized, uh, will be able to do a little better at the game, but people who don't have the pathways memorized will still be able to play. So I've played this with my kids. They've actually started memorizing the pathways, and I actually think there's a pretty good chance they could beat a lot of our neurology residents at this point. And part of the fun for me from a creative aspect was getting to come up with the backstory. Because you know, board games now often have backstories. If you think about the games you played when you were a kid, Clue is about trying to solve a murder, and Monopoly is about trying to be a you know disreputable real estate mogul and bankrupt your neighbors. Every every game has a story. So our story, we wanted it to be something that um, was based on history very loosely, but also had sort of a comedic element. And so. We called it Charcot's Tournament because Jean-Martin Charcot is often considered to be sort of the godfather of modern neurology. He was a 19th century neurologist. He trained a lot of people. And in the game, and of course none of this is true, but it's at least historically plausible, in the game he is on his deathbed in the 1890s and he calls all of these other neurologists from around Europe to come and compete in this game of neurologic localization and intrigue. And so people who are studying neurology will recognize the names of the characters, which are Babinski, Gowers, Korsakoff, and Alzheimer. And so these are all real people that have diseases named after them. And then they come and, and you get to play one of them competing against each other. And we sort of poke fun of the 19th century neurologists a lot because one of the things that defines that era is the eponyms. So all of the diseases from the 19th and early 20th century are named after people rather than named after what's actually wrong with the patient. Um, there was this hubris, I think, of associated with being a doctor back then. So in our game, the plot is that if you win the game, you get to have the honor of naming all future diseases after yourself. So it had sort of that comedic element and uh, to sort of bump up the level of fun, in addition to creating the game, as a parallel process, we also wrote uh, a song about the game, and then recorded a music video for that song. So all of these things put together, I think the goal, again, is to make this as fun, as engaging as possible while bringing out sort of the social and, uh, and competitive aspects. All right, so how did we actually do it from there? So we had our idea. We had our funding. Um, the real cost, and what was probably the biggest unexpected bottleneck in terms of how long it took to develop this, uh, was the graphic design. So uh, we hired an amazing graphic designer who I'd worked with in the past who does watercolor paintings. And uh, she designed somewhere between 40 and 50 original works of art for the game boards and the instruction manual and the cards and, uh, and the box. 
And, um, and that's a slow process. And I guess I hadn't anticipated how long that would take. It turns out with watercolors, you can't make any mistakes. And if you want to change something, you have to go start all over. Um, so that ended up taking close to a year. But once that was done, the actual development of the game was very quick because there are a couple of ways that you can do this. Um, the more common way that what real game developers will do is they will print out 500 or 1,000 or 5,000 copies and then have these boxes in storage somewhere. I didn't have enough money to do that and I didn't have a big enough office to keep all of those boxes. So we ended up engaging with a print-on-demand board game company. Uh, they're called Game Crafters. They are based in Madison, Wisconsin, I believe. And essentially, we upload all of the graphics and the instructions and everything to them. Uh, and then they only charge you when they're actually printing a game. So um, we, uh, we have these games for sale, but we sell them at cost, which turns out is actually fairly steep. To sell one of these games at cost is something like $27 or $28. Um, but we decided that this wasn't going to be an entrepreneurial effort for us so much as an opportunity to, uh, to create this educational product. Um, in addition to selling it online, which there have been sales, hundreds of sales all over the world, we also use it in a gimmicky way, which is we use it as sort of a swag gift for our residency candidates. So when somebody comes to interview for a neurology residency at University of Michigan, instead of giving them a mug or a t-shirt, we give them a, a beautiful board game that's actually been something that has really set our program apart uh, and, uh, and helped a lot with recruitment, which has been um, sort of a, a side interest of mine as the residency director. So we're now on the second edition of the game. Uh, we've made some tweaks to the rules and to the artwork um, and, uh, and released a new edition this year. And I think for me, the, the process has been, um, it was a lot of fun and I learned a lot. And the thing that I learned that I didn't expect to learn is a little bit more about game development. Having been through this once, I'm really excited to try to do it again because I think the lessons that I've learned will allow me to actually do a better job making a game that is more fun and has more replayability. Uh, and so we've been in discussions about creating a sequel that will be more about uh, the anatomy of the brachial plexus and the shoulder and it'll be a, a card game. I think the thing that I would do differently if I do another one is make the rules simpler. Um, playing the lesion is not complicated. If somebody explains it to you, I can explain the rules in three or four minutes. But if you don't have the person explaining it to you and you have to read the instruction manual, you could spend a half an hour reading them. And I think that, uh, that probably scares away some people. Um, I think the other thing I learned is games probably have the most fun element when they have the right balance of luck and strategy. And if there's too much of one or the other, uh, I think that scares away some people. So those are probably the things that I'm going to focus on the most in the next game. You know, I, I, I'm at an academic medical center. I work with a lot of residents and I work with a lot of students. And so uh, it was very easy for me to have a captive audience, um, to have uh, a group of students and say, hey, let's go spend an hour working on this together. And of course, they were always more than happy to get out of their clinical duties to spend some time playing a game. Um, and uh, I made a point of thanking all of those people, acknowledging them in the instructions, because I think we had 20 or 30 people that were involved with helping us refine it. And, uh, and they were not shy about saying what they liked and didn't like. Um, and before we made the second edition, we even um, interviewed somebody who you know, got the game, took it home, and then sent me an email saying, hey, I really liked it, but have you ever thought about A, B, C, and D? And we ended up taking many of those uh, suggestions and incorporating them in the second edition. And then that candidate ended up matching here, and she's going to be one of our residents this year. I'm a big believer that different people do learn in different ways. I know that that's controversial. Um, my mentor when I was in medical school, uh, who taught this very subject, uh, his name was John Harding. I went to school at the University of Wisconsin. And he would teach neuroanatomy in the very traditional ways. He would lecture about it, and he would give us a textbook. But then he would also give us a workbook and a video and flashcards, and um, I think eventually developed a, an interactive computer platform. And I really found that 
everybody in the class could find one or two of these things that they could really latch onto to learn this material. And it was the most popular uh, course at, uh, at medical school. And so I felt that a board game was different enough from all of those things because, again, it was social, because it was competitive, because it was interactive, because it was fun and had that element of, of humor. Um, just looking for another way to get to, maybe not everybody, but sort of another subset of learners that, uh, that would engage with those things. It keeps people awake. It keeps people engaged. Um, and that is, that is half the battle with learning, right, is having people who are paying attention. Um, and if you're playing a game and it's your turn, you have to pay attention. Nobody else can do anything until you think about what you have to do and do it. So you can't just tune out and turn off.